Hello. Hey, Jonathan. Please meet the guy. You can hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. And here's Leon. Hey, folks. Hi, Leon. Right. You got rid of my fancy backdrop. Let's see if I can get that right. There we go. <laughs> All right. Whew. So catch your breath. <laughs> this is also yes. going to this is also going to be quite quite a short, brisk, uh, right? Uh, Twenty five minutes, and the format I think is uh, you'll be presenting, right? Talking around the topics. Yeah, correct. With five minutes of questions. Yes, uh, unfortunately, I, I will have to uh, drop. I, I can continue answering questions uh, and and on itself, you know, on, offline. Yeah. So what I will do is I will jump off the screen. Um, okay, it looks blank. But when you're talking and presenting, I might jump off. I'm not sure, but it will leave a blank space. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, the uh, can can you let me know if when I'm going full screen does this work? Let me see. Can yeah. Hold on. Um, right now I see the same thing, uh, Leon. Yeah, we have to double click on it. Yeah, so that's going to be the thing. As in, like this. Yeah. Yep. Now I can see it uh, full screen. Okay. Do you see yourself? Uh, I cannot. I, I think for participants, uh, we have to double click on it. To, to uh, it. As in, so when I go full screen, it's not going to work correctly. It's fine. We can see we can see the the, the presentation. So so no no issue. Okay. One more thing. Let me just see if this works. Let's try this mode. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Great. Yeah. Okay, I'll leave it like this. Okay. <sighs> so let's see who's joined. Huh? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, we have Alan, um, Ahmed, Alex, Alison, Amit, Amjad. So um, alphabetical order. <laughs> Actually, are these all the participants today? Uh, I don't think they're in the chat. Yeah, I think I can see it looks like seven are watching this. Seven, yeah. Uh, I think I was reading just uh, from the wrong list of people. So are you okay to take any questions that come in as we go? Uh, sure. So we, we have, um, uh, we're literally at the end of our discussion. Uh, as in, yes, uh, we, we, we had a sort of open Q&A at the end, if that's okay. Yeah. Or, yeah. Is that all right if we just went through this? Yeah. I, uh, it sounds like you've got a lot to cover on this topic of compliance. So. Um, Shall we get started? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, welcome, everyone. I think more people will, will come along. But as time is only limited to just like 25 minutes for this, um, we've got a presentation today. So it's a little bit different format. It's still interactive. You can still ask questions in the chat. And, and this will be on the uh, tension between compliance and innovation. <clears throat> now. We've heard a lot about innovation and adding value to the organization, uh, but this is um, around navigating the uh, connection with governments uh, to create the services. Okay, so probably applies across a few industries, some more than others. Uh, so we've got uh, Guy Sharon and Leon Gultas. How do I pronounce your name, Leon? Uh, 
Uh, Guletsis. It is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> no problem. Uh, okay. And um, so um, from, uh, from Guy's point of view, he's the cloud adoption leader at IBM and advising a um, number of clients on the technical adoption aspects, people, process, and so forth to succeed. Um, working in IBM research and then the last five years in uh, IBM consulting in the cloud space, if I understand it correctly, um, and here to share the challenges and approaches and considerations. So I think from the other talks we've heard a lot, is it's about aligning the business and the technology, and it's not always technology-led, even though there's a lot of, a lot of great tech. Uh, Leon's uh, from the IBM garage. So I kind of looked up the garage and I found it's like a methodology. So I'm, I'm, perhaps you could explain what that is. Um, but working again closely with uh, clients um, around cloud strategy, um, design, build, all the te technical mod modules around the use cases, um, and supporting developer and entrepreneur co community. So an ecosystem outlook. Is that correct, Guy? Is that the way to describe the garage? <laughs> yeah, oh, we, we'd like to think so. It's uh, it's about bringing great tools and people together to look at uh, complex, hairy problems, and uh, we yeah. have a strong lend to merging technologies and uh, and uh, and cloud. So, yeah. So the, the the people and the technology comes together. That's the, that's the key message. All right, so with this, I think we've got like uh, a good 25 minutes. I know that you've got some slides, and I uh, really encourage everyone to sort of, if, if we need a pause in the slides, to just, just ask the question so that we can digest the information. So over, over to you, and I, I'll just I'll mute myself. So I look forward Thanks. to hearing, hearing the story around governance and innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, and, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I'll start by assuming that uh, we're, we all know what, what, what we are thriving towards, right? It's a digital capable business uh, that can respond to uh, market changes, pivot, innovate at the right speed and where APIs are, are a key tool to, um, to make that happen, right? And um, if we, um, you know, the, you may being aware of, of those five uh, stages of uh, API journey that uh, Ellen Glickenhaus often shares here in the API days in, in the past and, and perhaps today as well. But the idea is, you know, we're, we're trying to mature, trying to get uh, on that journey. And um, as, as we uh, go on that maturity journey, and it's not just, uh, it's not usually around, you know, internal APIs, public APIs, it's about how we bring on board, subscribe, get the experience around these APIs, get value out of those APIs. As we move towards that, we're picking up more and more what we call API practices. And um, uh, we're picking up more and we're establishing them in, in a more robust manner. And I've, I've put this slide on purpose just to kind of a bit create some deter deterrence here around, whoa, there, there's, there's, there's a few of them, and there's quite a lot, and to cover these things. And, and the danger really is around, as we pick them up, is that we, we and often I've seen that uh, at, at various uh, enterprises and companies, is that we, it actually stops us. Um, the danger is to stop us moving forward in that journey and almost stops us uh, to a halt, uh, and we get blocked by just applying these practices um, and trying to put it there. And often governance here, linked with the risk and compliance, is, is seen as, as, the, as a practice to, for, for you know, enterprise-grade uh, uh, adoption and um, dealing with compliance and, and making it really hard, right? Uh, uh, governance sometimes, because it's associated with risk compliance, has, has a little bit of a, a negative uh, at least my experience uh, with customers is is that it has a bit of a negative connotation. Actually, it's it, it's really is governance is really is what I see the the tension breaker for 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 that compliance and innovation because governance if if we look at that uh, it, it, it's not management it's more about um, 
you know, let this build up. Uh, uh, governance is really the idea of giving us the direction, the vision, the mission, the the purpose in which we're we're uh, we're delivering these APIs and why we want them to be robust, why we we want them to, you know, to bring us the opportunity. It, it it's supposed to offer us guidance, standardization, a, a room to play, and actually empowering us to innovate. Now, what, what is sometimes uh, misinterpreted or, 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 or linked is that uh, what is required uh, for accountability to, to meet the compliance needs and these, uh, and these factors. So if we, if we look at that, well, governance, Suppose well, if, if you're looking at the definition, is the mission, is a standard, is giving us the, the framework to operate in a empowered manner. Often when we are trying to look at uh, the accountability side of things, uh, how we are setting up our organizations, our teams, uh, what processes we implement, how we are controlling everything and what we are measuring, that's where uh, often uh, I've seen either stops us from bringing innovation or slows innovation. Once there is innovation and we're starting to be more compliant and more rigorous, starts slowing innovation down. And this is the area that uh, Leon and myself uh, would like to share with you how we, we are trying to address this space. Obviously, technology supports it, but more importantly, looking at the processes and the people aspects uh, of, of our organization to diffuse that tension. So I'll turn to Leon to, to take us through where typically, you know, we, we see some of the problems uh, that, that uh, come up in, in a process and people's uh, aspect and uh, see how we go from there. Thanks, Guy. So if we took a simplistic view for how we uh, innovate and create APIs, uh, and manage them and, and then scale them and involve our ecosystem, we would probably take this viewpoint of define, deploy, share, and manage. And we, we see this quite commonly shared in ecosystem um, and, and, and industry reports. And we think that's a really great place to start. Um, we also see, though, that there's a strong focus on technology. Uh, so whether around modeling and, and developing testing publication, uh, the, the catalog, products and catalog syndication, uh, creating developer portals around uh, subscriptions and uh, documentation and, and, and listing associated applications and source code and, uh, and um, you know, in terms of the gateway, whether, you know, the runtime sits and locking traffic and its utility or whether it's deploying on multiple clouds uh, or, or on-premise um, and, and encryption all the way through to even uh, SLA agreements, there is a lot of technology involved with making sure that we can uh, define, create, uh, test, deploy, and scale these APIs. If we just looked at governance and uh, as, as technology, we'll be missing out on, on a really great opportunity to explore more around how people are involved in this. And I want to do something a little bit different, perhaps a little bit unexpected, and. Uh, focus on people for a moment and just get you to think, just open up the aperture for a moment. We're here today at API Days virtually. Uh, and many of us will be the that second column, which is, you know, designers, develop, sorry, developers, architects, designers, um, maybe even some, some uh, people from, uh, say, data science teams and others who leverage those APIs. But stop and think for a moment, uh, the people out in the field, so to speak, um, or the line of business who will be, um, you know, uh, the uh, stewards of this API in terms of um, uh, the, the experiences that will be uh, created. Think about maybe the innovation teams that you interact with. Do you interact with uh, accessibility teams, perhaps? Um, think about whether it's working with business partners or technology partners, uh, whether it's around your, your own ecosystem or that of the open source community. And furthermore, whether it's your your cloud teams, your IT teams, uh, you, you know, uh, your your API uh, stewards, and even bots, there's a lot of different people that can be involved with the uh, the the experience of the APIs. Whether again, uh, in initiating, determining the need, um, all the way through to to that to that stewardship piece. And, um, and, and so from that, we've got a lot of different people's input that we can take um, into consideration um, if we were to create, 
if, if we see a need for a service. Um, and, and it's with that viewpoint, perhaps, that we could take a different look instead of those earlier four steps of simply define, deploy, share, and manage. Let's take a, 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 a more um, holistic viewpoint of thinking about the, the valuable assets in your organization that you're exposing as APIs. What does that mean to the developers who are turning that into applications and creating experiences for users? That is, in, it, when we think about uh, the tension between compliance and innovation, this is really the holistic view that we're looking at. We're looking at uh, customers and users, people helping to, um, to, to take those services and make them into something meaningful, along with feedback loops from the business, uh, from our uh, tech, technology teams, uh, all working in, in, in chorus, hopefully in unison, together, but we know that it's not that simple. And where we'd like to, to, to talk more in terms of today's uh, focus on, 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 um, on, on working through compliance and innovation is perhaps, uh, please consider some of these aspects. So think about that discovery process. We were talking about, uh, you know, the, the different uh, personas and different people involved um, in the creation of these services. At IBM, we're, we're big um, we're big fans of uh, design thinking, and uh, in the IBM Garage teams and and through our Garage method, we use this as a great methodology to understand the needs of our users, the pains and gains as they go through their tasks, and through that uh, ideate uh, together with them in the room, literally sometimes, uh, or virtually in the case of COVID. And, and working through to define what is the experience to be delivered and, and through that, our assumptions, our risks, building out hypotheses, building in market experiments um, and conducting user research about when is the service required, in, in under what context, how might that, uh, how might we consider big, big questions like and, 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 and data and privacy and, 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 and even ethics uh, around utilization of that service. Um, not to mention things like uh, security and, um, and new technologies like 5G and Edge uh, that, that are becoming more, um, more mainstream in, in adoption. And, um, and Guy, we've also seen some really great benefits with domain-driven design. Yeah, so thanks for, for uh, leading to me back. Uh, so um, yeah, I, Taking that back to uh, the people side of the aspect and more specifically organizational structures and uh, and how we address, you know, this maturity with the, comp uh, with the compliance issue, the constraints, and, and then, you know, um, still innovating. I've, I've seen, I've seen, the uh, main two patterns around how organizations are setting themselves up to uh, for this, where where they're hitting hitting hard um, roads on that. So on one side, um, you know, teams are assembled to specifically work on on APIs. So uh, dedicated teams um, that um, really on on the on the one hand, the, the advantage around that is. All these practices that we listed previously, and I hope you don't remember them, um, th these teams are very familiar with. They know how to do that. They know what the sec security and compliance requirements are. They know how to set it up. They've got the, the tools and the capabilities and the practice to do that. However, they become a bottleneck, right? Um, and, and we might move to the next slide. It could, it could help us uh, uh, have that discussion is that, um, if you know, if, if every API uh, uh, needs to be created, generated, used uh, for whatever you know, exposing core systems and databases to just uh, interfacing with with uh, our applications and and offering some some intermediary uh, information to to some front ends and mobile applications. One, they're, they're being a bottleneck. Who decides where the priorities are around which APIs to implement first? There's also the whole thing around who actually has the relationship with the end user or consumer or experience. And obviously, it's not going to be that API team. So 
all that dynamics and really what, what Leon was talking about gets gets lost here. And there's a lot of back and forth as well between between hey, this is not the exact thing that I was thinking about. So then if we look at it in a completely way about giving automa uh, having all these teams have complete autonomy, right? In in creating API, they can do whatever they want. Obviously, they have they control the end to end. They know who is going to consume it. They develop the APIs. They expose the API. They manage it, and and so it's all under their control. The challenges here are that you know I've got many teams that do that. Everyone does it differently. Different identity access management, certification secrets, uh, um, tools that they start picking up, uh, which which are are different, and um, you know all these practices. How can really a small team or or a significant team have the ability to touch all these practices, all these things, things up ahead uh, around that, to have that experience, and then you get repetitiveness, but also uh, uh, maybe lack of experience in certain areas. So the ability to create the compliance, compliance, and the uh, rigorness that the a company requires, it becomes uh, harder. So. Really, it's about how do we start leveraging the advantages that these two models actually have and bring that together. So, as you mentioned, you know, if you're if if you're able to look at at, at your business, at your operations, at your APIs from a domain-driven uh, aspect to it, then you could be you're you're able to kind of uh, understand, you know, where your autonomous teams could be where the dependencies could be broken apart and actually offer them a little bit more autonomy um, within that space. And, and therefore, you know, starting to look at the fact that, and we've talked about this in API days uh, several times around, not every API is the same, right? There are categorization of APIs. So same for those APIs, the practices that are to be uh, applied are not always the same or it's not at the same level and the, and and, and um, level of, of, of complexity in there so you could release in those autonomous teams um, you can allow them to do a, a bit more um, things that, that they they know and they control whereas in other a, a, um, apis like more towards the uh, uh, the system of records APIs that uh, that want to expose your core and your and your systems. Their focus will be more about how to meter this, how, how much access you get, you grant because every hit into the backend system is 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 costly, or or can you know um, lock it or 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 have have implications around it. So different aspects to different types of APIs where you start separating those controls. At the same time, as you. Exp we we're still thinking about teams or guilds. Depends how you you, you want to set that up. Independent guild, teams or or people loan from the different existing teams, and start helping build uh, these individual teams at different levels um, capabilities. For example, there's is a new security requirement or a new new compliance that is required. So can we get that team to actually look into it, find some libraries and packages that can speed up this work, can test this out and, and then release that capability to the rest of the teams once it's 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 uh, well adopted and, and, and works well and tested and, and approved by whoever that is, the CISO and that stuff and start separate, uh, disseminating that. That kind of a dissemination is also important around the cultures that you bring into to uh, around your your teams, right? It's it's about uh, caring about who, who's actually going to be using this, right? And so, um, creating an ecosystem around those capabilities and around those APIs. It's not enough, in my opinion, to to have a catalog with an API and some sample uh, and calls to understand how to do that. I'd, I'd like to see. Um, people contribute uh, some sample codes and some experience and some uh, issues around how they interacted between two APIs and there's a, a better method around to do that and this is how I capture the data and store it and and here's a, a more examples around um, what I've done here and and uh, so on and so forth so blogs uh, communications SDKs the uh, sample codes 
snippets around that that are not owned or not responsibility of the, whoever created it, but an ecosystem of all the rest of the developers, exactly like what's happening in, in um, Stack Overflow or, or these kind of environments within their organization to help out, you know, break that tension and, and create helpful uh, material to each other. Now, if you go back to that other slide, the, the final thing that I, I, um, I want to share and is that, um, yeah, it's building up that it's <laughs> not this one. That one era. <laughs> so it's a lot about the culture and about thinking about the change of mindset um, around, I think we, we talked about it in API days uh, uh, here and there about actually, you know, thinking about a service mindset where I'm providing a service or I'm consuming a service and what their responsibility is to um, the consumer or what my expectations are from the provider, right? So if we look at the the, the right side here uh, around core systems, databases that we're exposing, you know, the people in this space, usually when I come into to companies, is that they're concerned about I, I, you know, who gets to access this? There needs to be really approved authentication, a certification to get there, and I need to protect it. And the speed in which I'm, I'm, hit, I'm hit. I need to control that. That's true. Uh, but actually, that service that you're going to provide is going to be used by all the way up to upstream, right? All the way to the edge. So really, what you need to start thinking and changing the mindset around that is, hang on, if if I'm going to change something here, if I'm going to change my API, add some more capabilities, the impact of that upstream is going to be huge. So how about I start thinking about the things that usually these people are not, are not involved in is standing up a, a sandbox for a, a enough period of time, uh, supporting these teams to actually test these things out, see that they're going, provide them supporting people and and. And, and code and samples and things like that to make them successful, right? On the other hand, if we look at the way the left side, um, you know, in the, the application mobile, I'm, I'm guessing most of them are quite uh, are quite um, accustomed or, or think they have that consumer mindset and experience there. Uh, what they actually, in, in my experience, actually. Um, a lack of is is um, scrutiny on, scrutiny on the, on those providers, right? So really, what they do is is that they uh, subscribe to to APIs in the catalog, and from that point on, yeah, I, I'm I'm done. You know, I, I'll get a notification if the version gets updated, if, if something's there, strange. No, I, to to really be able to move fast forward, uh, uh, not relying on on all these um, challenges that are coming down from downstream is that you need to be proactive. You need to monitor, not just monitor the service and whether it's it's, it's providing you the right uh, serviceability and performance and things like that so that you can adjust your application, but also understanding are they planning for new versions, new updates, uh, can I, you know, and, and things like that. So you're, you're, you're setting yourself up and not being surprised like, ooh, something has changed my, 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 URL, my, my API structure is, is completely changed. Um, so bottom line, right, around that, what I want to take, 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 get you to take away from this is that um, really governance is a, a way to give us leadership, direction, uh, standardization, uh, empowerment for these different uh, teams, different uh, um, categorization of operations and, and, and stuff like that to um, to come together, work together. It's all, all about really where the tensions start to, to become is not just what technology to use, but how you implement your processes, how you setting up your organizations to work together uh, or, or against each other. And um, eventually, you know, uh, Leon, to, to, to get to that cross-pollination and, and other capabilities that we, we discussed, which you wanted to say a few words, things? Yeah, absolutely. Just so, so uh, automation and tooling uh, will help 
you know, bring development and operations together, but, and hopefully uh, we want to sort of eliminate over the fence behavior. Um, but what, hopefully today um, we've taken a peek even further about, you know, the importance understanding each other's role, understanding the experience that we're looking to deliver. So whether that's um, the, the, from the, uh, the, the API stewards uh, to, the, to the lay app developer, all the way through to the, to the clients and uh, customers themselves, um, a shared understanding um, of, of, the, of, of what, uh, the, the experiences to be delivered. Um, and, and of course, considering, um, and you mentioned it before, Guy, about um, you know, the importance of uh, creating uh, resources and access and, and um, you know, the idea of least privilege. Uh, that doesn't prevent us from the room and talking about um, how, if we gave access to these components, what, what could be, and whether that's through a sandbox or something as simple as a workshop, or whether that's um, you know sharing the the intent behind the design, um, it's going to give a lot of clarity and transparency as to why these services exist and how they're maintained and operated and managed. Uh, and lastly, I think what was really interesting uh, working this through today, uh, uh, Guy, was we we could not find one answer. We 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 looked at a, a number of different aspects um, from you know uh, examining about an everything is code approach all the way through to um, how um, you know, policies and and and, um, and and cultural behavior can drive cl cl a better collaboration, um, but there really is no one answer. But I'd love to hear from, uh, of course, our tuned in audience to, to see what questions that you have, and maybe maybe you might have an answer that that could by the rest of us. Okay, so well, Jonathan. Yeah. So thanks, Leon and Guy. We're, we're sort of at the top of the session, but we will keep it running for another five minutes. Um, and obviously, if anyone's got any questions, but I would like to pose one relevant question, if I may, from from one we received earlier, which see, which seems to be relevant here, is um, let me see. Um, what are some tips or examples of governing ba uh, of balancing governance with agility, uh, particularly in a high compliance environment such as a government or a bank? So what they've done is they've they've framed the question as governance with agility. Are they yep. are they separate? Are they together? What what are your thoughts on that question? So, I guess I, I put agility and innovation maybe in the same uh, space, hopefully, because uh, um, um, contradicting potentially governance and compliance. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I saw that question before, and I thought that the, our, our our session uh, would would kind of Address this through through these examples that we shared. I I, I would say that um, you know um, it's really it's really about like I said the, the, this categorization and really looking at the right uh, place and where we you apply this compliance and needs and strict versus where you can uh, let a few things go and. Uh, and drive it through the the problem that I've I've seen before is that it's like we need to be compliant. We need to. It's a black and white kind of thing where where well there are areas where you can be compliant but still play around with a, a few things and and try a few things and and position them and then bring them back in. So it's it really about uh, horses for courses, uh, same as we're looking at the data governance around, you know, there are different datas that some data can be put somewhere else and have a different way of interacting, same as with API, same as with developing them. We'll need to really try and, and, and break some of these strict rules by challenging and testing and trying to, uh, to break some of these walls by showing um value out of these exercises right and that's that's the only way to do it right it's it's what are you winning if you relax some of these constraints on some of the components uh, and that you can still uh, show that you're 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 compliant in, in in that sense it's it's really a balance and um yeah that I, I, it's just pushing the limits in in certain areas and and to me this this is innovation and that is entrepreneurship and it needs to be brought into 
those organizations who actually kind of um, stop that from happening. All right. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Guy. So I, I guess it, it is a, it is a process, right? Going from de define, deploy, and 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 sort of manage into design thinking, the pains and gains, into what you were just talking about, which is hypothesis and find out opportunities in which to give people autonomy, and then do so with a service mindset. Leon, did you have anything wow. else? Because we should. Wow, that's great. It's a great wrap up, Jonathan. Yeah, I was yeah. going to mention that the, that there's some there's great. Um, uh, you know, strength in bringing together different teams to to look at the problem. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, I've seen instances, particularly in financial services, where, um, you, you know, the answer initially was very much a, a technology solution. But when we really examined, you know, what, what what is the task that we're trying to get done under what can and the constraint and, and the context, we can work through that in a way that um, that that might be a re-engineered experience, might capture some new data that actually gives us the right levels of, um, in, in terms of compliance, the right approach to that problem. And I think there's, uh, so, and continuing that thread, um, you know, there's there's great strength as well about writing out your assumptions, writing out the big risks that you see and having a conversation about that. Um, and importantly, and one thing that often gets missed as well is about, um, in terms of adoption and utilization of these services that are being built, um, that there's nothing worse than seeing, uh, you know, a, a vast, and no one wants to see this, a vast sprawl of, of uh, APIs and, and, and services and, and, and data and, um, and, and runtimes everywhere that aren't being used. So how do we test to, to ensure that there's a real in-market need for this? Um, and and uh, balancing that, of course, with those sandboxes and experiments um, paper prototypes and other methods to see whether there's a need. Um, that idea of um, codifying the trusted resources, um, a guy mentioned about the you new know, sample code and, and reference architecture and uh, um, configurations and so on, um, patternizing, um, which is why guilds increasingly, particularly for complex organizations, is a great way to um, ensure that there's this collaboration and tra knowledge transfer across uh, across many different disciplines. So we're seeing guilds as a great answer to this. Yeah, so I think guilds would be one of the takeaways. I wouldn't want to put words in your mouth around agile. That's another story. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, yeah. How can people reach you? Because uh, we sort of, uh, we might be kicked off this. I don't know how long we can stay here for. But <laughs> how can people reach you during this event and after the event Cause in case they, they had some questions? So first of all, if there's another question, we can take that. Uh, so uh, yeah, let, let's try and answer one more question. But um, I, th I think um, Leon has put in uh, some of our details here, and um, um, I think we can, you know, our, our I think on the website, do we do we have uh, our details on there? Or yeah. uh, you're, you're you're on the website, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Re tweet at us, uh, uh, send us a message on LinkedIn, um, use the hashtags. Um, of course, we've actually got some amazing documentation and materials freely available. One of the great things that IBM Garage does is we, we, we embrace open standards and open source, and we publish a lot of uh, great material. Um, uh, for example, we uh, recently, some of our distinguished engineers wrote a really great modern DevOps manifesto, for example, that I'm a big fan of. Okay. Um, there's a lot of great material. So check out um, the IBM Garage, uh, ibm.com forward slash garage to read more. And the team that Guy and I come from, uh, uh, the, the technical solution acceleration team that, that works with clients to understand more about uh, how we can uh, move through adoption and uh, uh, of emerging technologies in cloud. Yeah, so feel free. This chat will be open afterwards. So if you guys have got giveaways, uh, T-shirts, uh, if you've got links, like, uh, then then please add it to the chat so people can also fast track to where you want them to go. Okay, so uh, we're, we're a little bit over the time. Thanks very much, uh, Guy and Leon. Um, with that, unless there's anything else, uh, we'll we're, we're, we're wrap this up. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Jonathan. You. Friends for joining. Thanks. Yeah. So we can carry on on the chat if you find some links. I'll be very curious to see these places as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, bye everyone. <laughs>